You know, when we were challenged with this idea of trying to predict the future of the next 150, isn't that a moonshot try to look forward 150 years? Looking back 150 years, so much has happened. Canada's contributed so much to the world around us. Trying to get our heads around what's going to happen uh, in the next few years is it's quite a challenge. Think about going back in time. You know, a little bit of Wayne's World, doodly, 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 we'll go back in time, talk to our great, 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 great grandparents and ask them what the world looks like today. What would they say? So part of my job is helping organizations understand where the technology puck's going, look out in the future. So I'm going to share some of my secrets with you tonight and how that's done. I think the first thing that we do is we take a look at the past, that strong heritage that we have, establish that as a foundation, and we take that step back and orient ourselves on what's happening today. And that's critically important because sometimes I think we're so busy that we don't take that step back and orient ourselves. And what's the next step, the most critical step about predicting the future? Designing it ourselves. Because if we design it ourselves, then we know what's going to happen. We define what's going to happen. And so come with me on this journey as we look to describe the future, <coughs> define the future, and secure Canada's prosperity for the next 150 years. So a short nine years after Confederation, Melville House, Brantford, Ontario, Alexander Graham Bell made a phone call to Mount Pleasant, the kind of neighborhoods where I grew up. Forever changing, transforming the way that people communicate. That first telephone call really had a dramatic impact on the world as we know it today. And we still see that impact on a day-to-day -day basis. A short 10 years later, Craig Lecky, BC, on this fine November morning, Donald Smith drove home the second golden spike for this photo opportunity. He bent the first one. <laughs> bringing together, connecting through steel, our emerging nation. Bringing our country together to seize the opportunity of the industrial age. A great innovation that was really showcasing to the world. Nine years later, Signal Hill, Newfoundland. A cold December morning, Marconi decided to fly a kite. What's it with kites and innovators? You know, Franklin decided to fly a kite and did the first transatlantic broadcast. Sent that signal around the world. Again, transforming the world around us. And these are just three examples in the first 25 years of Confederation. If we look and throughout the 150 years, there's many others from penicillin to the Trans-Canada Skyway, from Elsie McGillig and her revolutionizing mass production of aircraft, the Hawker Hurricane during World War II to the Java programming language. I could spend all night here chatting with you about the great innovations that are happening, great things that happen to propel things forward. Canada helping drive, punch above our weights, and set that agenda for transformation around the world. Now, it was said here earlier tonight that we don't take the opportunity to herald the advancements of Canada, to be bold, to be brash. Well, I've gone on a Trans-Canada Innovation Nation Tour to highlight some of these great examples. And I took the opportunity to stop by at Signal Hill last fall. And it was equally as cold and windy on that day as I stood there. And I pondered some of the innovation that was happening across Canada as I looked west. Because of course, if you look east, there's only a little bit of Canada left. <laughs> so I looked west and I thought about all the innovation and the transformations that Canada has been part of. I think of the steam age and the industrial age and Canada's contribution. The second industrial revolution, the internal combustion engine and manufacturing. The third revolution, and what we saw happening with the microprocessor and telecommunications. And I wondered, did Bell, Smith, Marconi, McGill appreciate what was happening? Do we appreciate our contribution to this fourth revolution, this fourth transformation? Have we taken that step back to look around, to understand what's happening in the world around us so we can contribute to that revolution and punch above our weight. Well, let me start with a mental exercise, right? Some people look at this transformation underway and they call it the digital economy. So let's all take that pause and think about some word association, digital economy. What does that mean to you? So I'll throw up some funky graphics around these connections, but certainly some things will come up. We've heard a lot about social networking today. Internet of Things might come up, that connected refrigerator, next generation networks, cloud computing, robotics, 3D printing, blockchains and bitcoins, big data. So we hear about all those things. Anybody think about those? Sure you did. Fantastic, you're all right. Winner prize. So, so that's important. But we as people, 
we need to make sense of the world around us, and we often try to organize things to make it simple for us. So we're ruthless organizers. And when we think about digital technologies, we might automatically jump to ones and zeros. We might automatically jump to STEM skills. We might automatically jump to coding. And that's okay, but it might help us then pigeonhole these things to something that we don't see on a day-to-day -day basis. We see the technology, oh yeah, the digital, yeah, I'm gonna use some digital economy now when I tweet. Or I'm gonna use these tools and techniques. We see the tools and techniques and we don't realize that these things have slowly crept their way into every aspect of our lives. They've intertwined themselves into our business lives, into our social lives, into the fabric of our garments. So as I've traveled this country, no, not in the RV, but I've gone off and talked with business leaders and policymakers, and I'm starting to see some of these things come together. And we all intuitively know that the education systems are connected and intertwined with digital technologies. We've used massively open online curriculum to learn and to educate people. We know that the banking system's there. We know that it's in healthcare. But sometimes we haven't recognized it's gone throughout the environment. I love this example around the farmer. Think about that picture and the image of a farmer. A little bit of word association, what do you see? You might have come up with overalls, Kodiak boots, straw hat, corn cob pipe, that type of thing, anchored on that, per on that perspective. But when you look at farming today, the farmer knows exactly where to plant the seed because it's done with GPS. He knows how much water that seed's received over the term. He knows how much fertilizer that seed needs to get. He knows where the next seeds are. He knows where, when properly to harvest those seeds and perhaps He's driving a harvester that's computerized so that he doesn't even have to be in it, so it's an automated process. He knows how, when to harvest it and when to sell it. These things are all intertwined. And if you see, if you've anchored your thought on that farmer, of that person with the scythe that's taking down the crops, you might not see the opportunity that presents itself with today's world and environment. So we need to take that nudge and move ourselves from those anchor points to the broader view and the broader perspective. Let me help drive this home. Let's go back to Craig Leckie, right? Early days of Confederation. How did we do our business? What was the engine that drove the Canadian economy? What was this behemoth? Required eight people to drive. You had a fireman, you had an engineer, you had someone that heated up the boiler so the, the thing didn't explode. You had someone that came in later on to clean it up. Now, if we use this as a frame of reference for our business, for our processes, for our lives around us, well, we're sadly going to be dated. If we look at a business perspective and say, hey, we're going to supply stuff for this thing, how big is our marketplace? Pretty small. There's not too many of these trains that are still driving today. I know, I know. It's kind of a, a cheap trick. You're saying, John, you know, steam train? Seriously? Who do you think I am? All right, so let's fast forward, go to our current frame of reference. And if we're doing business with trains in, in Ontario, in any case, we might go to Union uh, Station in Toronto, and we see this great uh, diesel electric vehicle. And so we get an understanding of the speeds that are involved with this, how we refuel those uh, vehicles, kind of the interiors of those things, and we expand our marketplace. And we understand that, hey, this is how the business works, these are the rules that works. So we see beyond the technology and we see that, hey, there's broader opportunity. Again, what's the size of the audience with this? Right? So this might be Ontario, and we might go as far as Canada. World leaders are driving these. Right? Completely different speeds. Right? The rules have changed. So the world leaders are driving those things. If we're not looking back and we're not looking around the world at these things that are happening, then we're going to be missing out. And those emerging nations, they're not going through the steam age. They're not going through the diesel electric age. They're going right to this. Or perhaps they're not even going to tracks. They're putting magnets in these things and floating them above the earth. Or, hey, there's even this Queens grad that suggests we're going to fire people through tubes. Right? So it's not just the technology as well. Technology is part of it, but we're going faster. There's different rules associated with that. So let's take another uh, mental activity. Have you ever gone over to your friend's house, started to play a board game, and all of a sudden there's that $500 bill that's in the middle of the board? It's like, what's that? That's not in the rule book. Oh no, that's house rules. We've always done that. Or maybe there's an extra tile on the Scrabble board. We're playing with eight letters instead of seven. Okay, that's kind of interesting. House rules again. How does that make you feel and how does that set you up for success? Well, now all of a sudden you're uncomfortable. You don't know the rules of the game. You're not sure how things are moving. And are you going to be successful? No, because, hey, that person that invited you is probably going to skew things to make it easier for them. The rules of business have changed. And we've heard a lot about Uber. We've heard a lot about Airbnb. 
Okay, let me bring it local. We've heard a lot about snow more, and once your driveway's clear to the snow, uh, you know, share my driveway, you know, those things. So we see that, hey, the world is dramatically different. The sharing economy, the freelance economy, right? crowdsourcing, the rules have changed in this, in, in this environment. We even see policy and standards having to change. So those that are successful in this new world of work, we're going to be writing the rules, right? We've seen recently a lot of debate over Uber and taxis, right? People coming almost to blows over Uber and taxis. Right? And they're talking about who drives the vehicle. Well, what happens when the driver's no longer there? Right? Who's writing those rules? And let's think beyond the, the, the taxi cab. What about the driverless truck? Because driverless trucks are coming. It'd be great because they don't have to stop at the border anymore. They just carry on through. Great boon for productivity. But who's writing the rules for that? We need to write the rules to establish that future for ourselves. And so we have this um, rather dynamic environment. We have technology changing very, very rapidly. We have this interaction between technology and social rapidly changing. We have this landscape changing rapidly. So how are we going to ensure that we're prosperous in the next 150 years? Well, do we need to ensure we're prosperous? Maybe we need to take a look at that environment and say, well, how are we doing for prosperity? Well, there just so happens to be an organization that measures that, Institute for Competitiveness and Prosperity down in Toronto. And they looked across 16 regions in North America, and they ranked them. Two Canadian regions made the list, but we finished 14th and 16th. And so they looked at that prosperity and said, well, why is that? Well, they figured that the prosperity gap is a productivity gap. So if you increase productivity, your prosperity goes up. And they said, furthermore, that productivity gap is an innovation gap. And so we need to innovate. We need to innovate more. So this is not ideation. It's not simply coming up with ideas. It's not invention. This is innovation, taking that idea, bringing it to market, and changing the way that the landscape looks. And that's important because I've gone off and talked with startups across the country, and there's a lot of fantastic ideas out there. There's accelerators across the country, people doing great stuff with technology. And guess what? You can't use it, or it doesn't fit with the particular environment, or it's very, very focused on a problem that's here in Canada. So we need to be able to innovate and go beyond that, look that broader sense to be able to build these things out. Now I said that, look, technology is interwoven into every aspect of our lives. We need to innovate using technology as part of the business. Now, we've heard it many times, Canada, Canadians tend to be, don't rock the boat, don't upset the apple cart, a little bit risk averse. We don't invest in technology as much as other nations. How much so? Well, there's another center, it's a center for everything, a center for stand, uh, the study of living standards, just here in Ottawa. And they looked at investment in technology from Canadian companies. And would you know it, Canadian companies invest 53 cents on technology for every dollar that a US company would invest in that. So we're not going further, we're not investing as far, we're not going off and seeking that opportunity. We're not putting ourselves out of the comfort place. We're not rocking the boat. We're not looking for new opportunities. We're not looking for opportunities to fail. So we need to work better on the innovation. So everybody, when you go out, I want you to simply innovate. I need the teleportation machine because I'm kind of swamped. The traffic here in Canada is bad. It's booming, so it's just hard. So go off and do that. Uh, yeah, right, John. We need to build our innovation muscle because this is a marathon. It's not simply the Hackfest weekend. I'm going to come in and do version one and then I'm going to disappear. I need to see it through to version two, to version three. I need to grow that out. I need to take away that stupid exit strategy that says, hey, I'm going to be acquired and sell my business for $10 million. I need to be the next billion dollar business. We need Canadians to stand up and be bold, be a little bit brash and say they're going to be the next big thing. And again, it's more than just the technology. It's the next big thing that brings us together. What is that moonshot? What is that next opportunity? So we're at a critical point. We're at this signpost, this one here at the end of second line. We're at a critical point. We have a decision to make. We can choose to be staid. We can choose to be stoic. We can choose not to upset the apple cart, not to rock the boot. And we can watch as others write our future. We can stand by and be fast followers but we might not be able to secure our prosperity. <coughs> or we can accept that gentle nudge from the status quo. We can accept that gentle nudge to look beyond our 
point, current point of reference, that anchor. We can look globally and we can write the rules to secure Canada's prosperity for the next 150 years. Thank you.